I don't know if I can apologize, but I will explain the, the reason for the, the you, you can leave any time you want, but you can't come in later and expect to figure this out. And over the, this is a 20 hour curriculum that doesn't repeat itself and it's all interconnected. I'm gonna do it in three hours. So we will be less experiential per se. We miss some of the experience stuff, but you'll get as much of the content as I possibly can. The, a workshop and an experience or stuff is nothing unless it connects from the beginning to the very end end and delivers the, the message that you intend for it. So as you develop your workshops with what you do, know that you know how you connect the, the morning to the afternoon is really critical. And for me, the part of this is about how I learned to connect um, the low element experience in the morning where we're all really tight and connected to the high element experience in the afternoon where it seems like it's one person and it's just not really the team anymore. And it can still stay really incredibly connected in this workshop is part of what I learned about how to do that. The who uses challenge by choice in their program? Okay, good. Who doesn't? Who's never heard the term before? Okay, okay, good. That's right. The um, so so I'm here today um, to challenge what you've been told about choice, and perhaps validate, and encourage you to follow your intuition and musings on the subject and dealing with choices in terms of both yourself and other people. Uh, we're gonna do a quick game of have you ever, and if you could just stick your hand up in acknowledgement when you hear these. Have you ever been nervous before presenting or teaching? Have you ever told someone else what you think they should do? Have you ever appreciated encouragement from another to try something new and challenging? Have you ever really felt uncomfortable with what you're being asked to do in a class, at work, or in public? Have you ever done it anyway? Have you ever felt uncomfortable with what someone very close to you asked you to do? Did you do it anyway? Have you ever participated in rock climbing or challenge course? Have you ever participated in a traditional trust fall? Did you drop anybody? Anybody get hurt? Lawsuit, I uh, testified in three around the trust fall. Have you ever lacked the words to, to advocate for yourself? Have you ever lacked the words to advocate for yourself? Have you ever had a participant refuse to put on a harness? Really, don't make them safe to climb down. We used to a lot in the old days. Team Beth. Have you ever been able to say no with confidence when the choices before you were not what you felt were right for you? Have you ever coached a participant stuck on a high element for more than a few minutes? For more than 10 minutes? For more than 30 minutes? For more than an hour? Up to an hour and a half? Yeah, don't do that either. Have you ever wanted desperately for your participants to succeed? Have you ever been confused with what participation really meant? Have you ever struggled with promising participants a choice, but you still wanted them to try? Have you ever coached these people further when they told you that they wanted to stop or come down? Have you ever struggled with the difference between encouragement and coercion? Encouragement and coercion. Have you ever questioned using the trust fall ever again? Um, have you ever experienced what you believe was a true failure for a participant in your program? If you answered yes to one or more of the above, you're not alone. There are moments in the course of each of our careers where we take a serious look at our own beliefs and actions regarding risk, choice, and success on a challenge course. If you're having that conversation, be present, pay attention. The universe is trying to tell you something. 
So um, what I'd like to start with is a, a, a little bit of a background, a little bit of understanding of where I come from. Um, the, and I do this in every single workshop I do, and this might help you. It helped me to get warmed up, and I need you to know the context that I'm coming from. Uh, the work that we do, I basically divide into four levels, and my inspiration for this structure came from a guy named Bill Proudman, um, who all who had about three levels, and they were slightly different. But um, always attribute your your uh, your inspiration, if nothing else. The most basic level of the work that we do is something called I now call an energizer. And an energizer could be an entire day of activities. The intention is to connect people to each other, build relationship, and have fun. Energizers are awesome. The problem with energizers is that beyond that connection of, of being human beings, there's not a lot of other stuff that really happens, and nor should, should it. The second level, going a little bit deeper, is the way that I was introduced to experiential education. And that's what I now call discovery. And discovery is when we lead people to an activity, we give them a briefing, we show them how to spot, we start the activity, and then we stand back with our coworker and we simply watch at a distance while they struggle and get into trouble with each other, create the process, that spiral where they're going down the drain like this. And then when the activity's over, we attempt to debrief it and try to get the transference to happen from this experience in which actually everybody in the circle had a completely different experience. It just looked like they were all in the same place at the same time. That's discovery for me. Going a step deeper, we almost transition from facilitator and discovery is a valid process, but what comes out of discovery is that each of us in that experience have a very personal experience in a group of other people. And the debriefing, what comes out of that is and when people leave, they leave with personal stories and personal messages. But what isn't happening at that level necessarily is a deep connection within the group about being able to work together effectively. If you need to go deeper, if you've promised to develop a team, transform people, you've promised an outcome, you're moving into a realm called skill development. Skill development at that level, essentially, you have moved theoretically from being a trainer or from a facilitator who's guiding a process to a trainer who's delivering curriculum and content. At skill development, you are then taking what you know that you need to teach people and you're delivering it using experiential methods. I taught canoeing for, for years, starting in the late 70s. I was doing skill development. How to, you know, the, the safety equipment, how to get in and out of a canoe, the, the different, how you paddle, um, white water, quick water, dealing with the winds, all kinds of stuff. I was teaching a skill. When we look at cognitive content, we can look at it in a similar way. Are there skills, things that people need to know? So if I'm gonna promise that someone, I'm gonna help someone build their team, what are the cognitive and effective skills that we can look at and say, you need these things, boom, 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 to build a team. And in my workshop, I guarantee I will hit every one of those skills and you'll walk out the other side of this workshop and you will be able to perform at that level. And oh, by the way, it'll take 30 hours and not two. Skill development is knowing your curriculum. Skill development is knowing your direction. Skill development is being incredibly intentional in the delivery of curriculum in an experiential pro pro process to the point where you can guarantee the outcome of what's going to happen. And finally, four is intervention. Intervention is the deepest amount of a level of work that we can do. People who do therapy do intervention work. People who work in the wilderness in therapeutic programs do intervention work. Intervention with intervention, individuals or the group are in some level of trauma or pain. The intervention, we use the experiential methods, the outdoors, the challenge force, whatever, to help them see the, the trauma and the pain that they're in, to be able to self-identify, to start to look at tools, to practice, to set goals. So this is a very deep, deep level of work. The work that I do in most of this workshop is at this level called skill development. But the work that I do and in this workshop 
um, I think fits marvelously with, with intervention. Four levels. How's everybody doing? Any breath? All right. As we head off on our little adventure today, I'm going to give you a little bit of tool that I work with. It's called the Laws of Adventure. And the Laws of Adventure, there's three of them. And essentially, it's the way that I look at the work that we do. And it keeps me in check, it keeps me in balance, it keeps me from pushing people too far because I have these three rules. It's like iRobot, the three laws. This is adventure, three laws. The first law is adventure is not safe. Don't ever promise safety. I promise you'll be, please tell me I won't get hurt. You can't do that. It doesn't work. You're making a legal promise when you do that. If you get hurt, you broke it. Adventure is not safe. There's risk involved. And actually in adventure, there's actually danger involved. And it's our risk management process that tries to keep us out of danger. But come the day at some point in your life, the worst possible day of your life, based on a choice that someone will slip over into danger, and there is the possibility that someone will die. Have you ever had a person in your immediate care in an adventure program die? That is the outcome that you have to accept and understand for the choices you make. People can die. The choices you make and the choices they make are the difference between life and death. This is big business. This is an important thing. Team breath. Been there, done that, sat through a $15 million lawsuit. Consequences big, potential small consequence big. To know what you're getting into. And that, for me, that was 1986. And I, I'm more excited than ever in the work that I do and the importance of it. But I have a different mindset. Two, adventure is not safe, but the law of safety says. There's nothing I could possibly put out for my group to do and participate in. And everything that I suggest somebody should do, I should always temper with the belief that there's nothing worth getting hurt for. There's certainly nothing worth dying for in my curriculum. Know that there's a place and a time to step back from your curriculum and say, the safety of my participants is more important than this event or the message that I have. Know when there's a time to step back. For the good of the people. So know when there's a time to let go. Finally, the third piece that pulls for me, pulls this all together, is an incredibly important piece. It's called the law of choice. And the law of choice is a re-scripting of challenge by choice. And I started in the field before challenge by choice was even put out there. And I lived through the beginning and we messed it up really badly. The law of choice essentially says, in this experience, the only person that I can volunteer is you can only volunteer yourself. And that is the essential component of an adventure experience. The only way that a person will truly develop the curriculum and understand and change and transform is if they fully and responsibly choose it for themselves. You're talking people into it, they're only getting part of the program. Law of choice. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right. Have you ever, have you ever done uh, the, um, you know, the wind in the willow activity with the circle? So we have, now I'll, the, the term that I use for it, on the East Coast, it's willow in the wind, uh, circle of friends, trust circle, Lots of different names. What? The washing machine. Why does that make me nervous? <laughs> In that activity, there's a circle. And one at a time, people go into the center. Yes? 
We on the same page? And then people stand like this and people do this thing and a spotter's ready and we fall back and forth. And have you ever seen somebody drop? In that activity, here is my question for you. This is a key component overall in this thing about choice. During that activity, what behaviors would you say you could report to me that you observed in the other people, not you, you gotta talk about anybody but you, what behaviors do you observe in others during the win and the willow activity? Not you, others. What behavior do you observe? Let me write that word up there so we can really see it. What behavior, O-B-S-E-R, observe. Yes. Focus. You observe focus. What behaviors do you observe? Giggling. Giggling. What behaviors? What? Distraction. Distraction. Avoidance. Caution. Uh, say that one again. T-E-N-S-I-U-N. Tension. Who said that? Okay, good. Because with my hearing loss, the words kind of blur a little bit. So thank you. What do you observe in those people? So people looking out and in, out or in? People look away. Did I get the full thought? Okay. Aggression, hence the washing machine, spin cycle. I can, I can tell you how to get rid of the washing machine. I can, I can help you get rid of the washing machine. No, meaning stop that behavior, unless you like it. Okay. To prove, to prove themselves. Do I have that right? Okay, other observations. Do you say some of them like step out or step back? They pull back. Hold back, hold back. Three weeks till hearing aids. And in the meantime, you're all educators and facilitators. Please enunciate for your participants. <laughs> Observation. Worry they will fall through the cracks. I, I know what you mean. I got that. Yes. Tense body. Tense body. So, what did you observe? What did you observe? Work with me on this. What did you observe? So, so what? So arms, so watch, arms stiff at sides. What else? Shallow rapid breathing. Shallow. <laughs> rapid breathing. What else? Fear. What's that? Fear. Fear. What else? What's that? Rolling eyes. What else? So they they do this as they fall. They kind of they. I don't know what to call that, but so. 
self rescue step forward as they lean. They step forward as they lean, self rescue. Do you see a difference between the two columns? I have enough, I think. See a difference? What is the difference? Which is which? The third is the major, the other is our assessment, interpretation. Great big story you made up and make it as a lie about somebody else. This is true. This is your fantasy. This is true for everybody. This is all the stuff that you made up and you convince yourself that you know exactly what's going on with that person. And we're all still good people, but it ain't necessarily so. You might be exactly right, but you have no data to prove it. Observations, this is all part of choice. Observations are based on what? Because we don't have a shared mental model on what that word means. And there's not a single group I've ever worked with that had more thing in the left column than they did in the right. What is an observation? It's an opinion. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. So I'll put that over here. Sorry. Observation. What is an observation? Okay. Observations are specifically based upon the five senses. And they are what you um, what you hear, see, see feel. feel, meaning touch, yep. not feel, taste, taste smell. and smell. It has to be one of these for it to be observable. Otherwise, it's a great big fantasy you made up. Human beings are masters of interpretation. We bring in the observ observable data and it gets translated in our mind in a heartbeat. And that is the reason why our species has taken over the planet because we are able to assess and interpret. When we observe, we are basically doing something that is true for all. When we assess, we're doing things that are basically true for me about A B O U T U. I have made something up and now I'm putting it on you. Now, how, how could that be wrong? We're really good at interpreting. We're here, we're a successful species, except we might be killing the planet, but don't get me started on yet another political thing. Um, assessments are your opinion. Assessments are your story. Assessments may or may not have anything to do with what's actually going on with that person. Assessments are your fantasy projected upon another. So if we observe and we assess, what do we do with our assessments? When we make up the story, what do we do with it? We react or we act. We observe, we obsess, and then there's an action that comes out of it. Or it might be inaction too. We observe, we assess, and we act. On a challenge course, that can have some pretty big consequences. Three questions for you, and this will drive to the point and then I'm on my next subject. Have you ever, this is why I play the game, told someone one, I know how you 
You ever done that? So if I say, I know just how you feel. Anybody have a response to that, an emotional response? What is it? Doubt, defiance, defiance. kind of icky, isn't it? You mean you know how I feel? No, you don't. Or how could you? Two, have you ever told someone I know what you need. You can, it could also be, I know what you're thinking. That's a, that's a good one. I know what you need. I know what you need. I know just what you need. You need to learn a lesson. You ever heard that one? You heard that one? Ugh. Do you really know what they need? I don't know. You might. I know why you did that. Anybody have a reaction to that one? Probably similar. What's your action? reaction? Frustration. Why? Because have you ever had someone say, I know, I know why you did that, and then they go on with this whole thing, and the whole time you're like, what? <laughs> it's not, oh, no, no, no. You're getting defensive now. And that means it's true. You ever had somebody say that to you? And you're like, you're crazy. What, what psychological model that you discovered where it's right to tell somebody what they need and convince that they're, you're right and they're wrong, and then you blame them that they're being defensive, so it must actually be true. It's horrid what we can do to each other with misassessments. Now, rather than become all crazy and fearful about ever talking to anybody again, and I have a great anxiety when anybody talks about giving and receiving feedback. And I missed your workshop. I really wanted to see that. My anxiety is, is that in my experience, when people give each other feedback, a disproportionate amount of time, the feedback they start giving is a misassessment that they project upon the other person while the group sits there and then they take on that same belief and when the person starts to defend themselves, everybody just starts to disconnect from the person. So giving people feedback is critical. It's valuable. It's important. But it can be wrongly assessed. If it's wrongly assessed, that person is now branded and possibly set more distant from the group. If you want to make the right action as a response of your interpretation based on what you observe, what should you do? Well, it's not even feedback. It's ask them. If you want to know what's going on for another person, instead of I know how you feel, what would you say? Tell me how you feel. Open-ended. It invites the dialogue. It invites their group. And you're not projecting and making them something they're not. You can have your assessment. But ask them first. What's, how, how do you feel? What do you need? What do you need right now? You're stuck up there standing with your foot up on the top of the leap of faith, and you're standing there struggling in the start-stop syndrome, hesitating. Hey, what do you need up there? How do you feel? What do you need? Finally, what do you want to do? The problem with our programs and challenge by choice is that we have all been hypnotized by the structures of the challenge course and experience, by our own successes and experience of other people's successes in the past. And we are now hypnotized into the realm of, if you do what I did, you'll learn what I learned. Anybody ever tell a group that or hear that or experience that? You can't believe that just because an experience was wonderful and powerful and a big breakthrough experience for you, that every other person coming along wants, needs, will benefit or won't fail at the thing that you found was just this life-changing event. It doesn't follow. In a lot of cases, it won't work out. And here's why. How's everybody doing? Team breath? Yeah, quick question, I'll catch my breath.
Yes. Based on. Good. That's why you don't want to leave this workshop before it's over. Because what I'm doing right now is I'm probably kind of shaking some of your beliefs and your platform. I'm already feeling a little anxious right now. Like, oh man, did I screw this up? I screwed this up for years long before you were born. And I'm now more excited than ever because I figured some stuff out. You're going to make mistakes. So, so get over that. Um, but, just, but just stay present because it takes a while. It took me 42 years to figure this out. So, and I'm going to give it to you in three hours. So, it's kind of like a movie. So, I'd like to tell you a little bit about why we're likely to misassess what our participants need, specifically on the high elements, but throughout the entire program. And I call this the paradox of risk. And it looks like this. Um, and the paradox of risk basically says, I need to feel safe with you before I will take on any real risk. If you remove the pressure I feel to perform, I will make better choices and will amaze you with the risk that I take. When I feel safe with you, I will risk more. I was always taught that people come to us in their comfort zone. They show up, hey, they're in a comfort zone and you need to get them out of that. So let's do some mic breakers and let's look like a chicken and Let's walk around backwards and go backwards with our hiney pointed towards other people. Let's do all these things to get people out of their comfort zone. Let me tell you something. You create such an incredibly unsafe environment for certain people in your group when you put them out there and make them look goofy. In a corporate group, you'll lose two thirds of your group in the first five minutes when you're too goofy with them because they don't want to look that way. If you've got a lot of introverts who don't want to have attention call themselves and don't want to look bad, you're losing them, you're driving them out, and they're going to spend the entire experience hiding from you from the rest because they don't know the next time that you're going to, in their mind, attempt to humiliate them. You can't drive somebody out of their comfort zone. When you try to drive a person out of the comfort zone, or when you want to, or when you do, they end up out in a place called Risk. And risk is the place of adventure. When we get out in risk, there's actually the chance of having these great, wonderful, amazing breakthrough experiences, which is why I am in the industry. I had those experiences. I had breakthroughs you cannot possibly imagine as I went from into the challenge course industry in the years since. I believe completely in the value of experiential education. I believe passionately in the power of a challenge course, an intentional challenge course experience. But I now know beyond a shadow of a fact that I have no idea what you need today to grow. And I cannot hold any attachment to you doing certain things with the belief that you'll have certain outcomes. So I have to step back from all the things that I believe. And here's some of the things that I believe. The facilitator's dilemma is the first one, and I call it. My success today is tied directly to yours. If you don't get to the top, catch the bar, step off the zip line, then I have failed. In any time, in any element out there, did you feel that if a person didn't fit, complete the activity, that somehow you would let them down? The conflict of intent. I promised you choice today. But my language and actions when you struggle will suggest that I want you to keep going past your stated point goal or the point that you stall and freeze. The fallacy of your experience. If you do what I did, you will learn and feel what I did and have the same gains that I do. The misassessment. I know what you need, I know what you're feeling, and I know why you did that. The limits of your responsibility. Even though you may be absolutely right in what someone needs to overcome or to accomplish, you could be completely correct in your assessment. You should consider whether making it known or forcing them to take those tasks is the right goal for the day. You might be right, 
but it is your choice and your authority to shove them, push them, propel them, even with the best of intentions to that end. There's a way around all these. Um, and then there's the curse of Yoda. Do or do not, there is no try. Actually might be the solution too. Deep breath. So in the work that we do, I was taught that they come in their comfort zone and my job is to get them out into risk. So we do these ice breakers to warm them up and stuff and get them ready to go out and have all these big adventures. Beyond risk is an area called danger. Let me define the three. Comfort zone is a place where I'm in a state called equal equilibrium. It's a physics term and it means that the force of all, the sum of all forces is equal to zero. There's nothing pushing or pulling on me. I'm relaxed, I'm calm, I might be happy, I might just be relaxed. Um, you can learn in the comfort zone. You can learn lots, reading a book in the comfort zone, watching a video, watching somebody else's. You can have very cool learning, but it's more visceral, it's more powerful, it's more moving when it's your experience. So when people end up out in risk, they enter a state of dis equal librium. And that means that the sum of all the forces is out of balance. What makes a zip line work? Disequilibrium. You got the higher point launch and the lower point landing. You put the trawling person on there and they go zipping away. So I won't tell you what I think of modern zip lines, but with that, I will. <laughs> The most dangerous element, that the most deaths in the challenge course industry is the facilitator using the zip line. The facilitator launch is the number one possibility of a person dying is the person launching people on the zip line. line. Person on the other end receiving them. Guess who's third? Participants. Midline collision with stuff. Danger is real. The work that we do, if you climb a pole without a belay system, it's dangerous. If you climb a pole with a belay system, it's risky if everything is in good position. The material's in good shape, you've got a competent person, there's good communication, good program, it's risk. Without those things in place, it's dangerous even with a belay system, an inattentive belayer. Um, comfort zone, risk, and danger. I was initially taught that my group arrived in the comfort zone. I now know from experience that when people show up in my program, they show up where? They get off the boat, they get off the bus, they're at risk. When you walked in this doorway Thursday morning, my assumption was is that, especially new people, that there's risk coming into a new setting. I don't know anybody, I don't know what's gonna happen. How are they gonna create a workshop? They come in at risk. My job as a facilitator is to assume my assumption that I will act upon is that there might be risk. And so I find a way to remove the risk by making a situation where people might choose to feel safe. Therefore, the number one job of facilitator starts here, it's to create the comfort zone, to bring the group together to create a safe place. All voices are heard. Everybody's opinion is valued. Everybody's choice is respected. That alone cuts a lot. You don't need people to feel risk when they walk in the door. You want them to feel comfortable at the earliest moment and people get there at different times. So they arrive in risk. You have to establish the comfort zone and then comes the time to get them out of the comfort zone. When you're in the comfort zone, there's a couple of ways to do that. One way, is to impel them, propel them, get them out of there, do activities that will take them out of their comfort zone. Excuse me. When you do that, if you miss us or, or always for some people, propelling them to people get propelled to danger. And that's when people will start saying, I don't want to put on the harness. I don't want to climb the pole. I need to go to the bathroom and you find them two hours later hiding someplace else. The situation, the environment feels so dangerous to them and 
nothing has been done to help them form the comfort zone with the people that they're with. Do we have a big responsibility? We assume this, we establish this, but how do we get them into risk and not propel them into the danger? How do you do that? It's all based on the concept of choice. A person who chooses a challenge for themselves is, is vastly more likely to choose risk than danger. When I choose for my participants and I'm not aware of all the biases that I carry, I'm, some of my people are going to end up across the line in danger. And then what happens is you start seeing people freeze up on elements. Have you ever seen a person up on an element, the face turned pale, face turns red? Have you ever seen somebody's face turn blue? You know what you do then? Call 911. Yeah, that's bad. Blue's not a good color. Blue jean color in the face is not a good color. The whole body's that color too. Have you ever seen a person at height lose their voice, unable to respond? You're trying to talk to them, they don't call back. Have you ever heard, seen a person at, at height tell you they were scared? Have you ever seen a person at height freeze? Hug the pole. Um, have you ever seen a person at height just kind of hesitate? Have you ever seen somebody at height start and stop? And start and stop. Start and stop. Have you ever seen somebody wet their pants? You know, the, the, the term pamper pole, it's, it's a true story. Somebody wet their pants way back in the 70s and Carl Ronke was facilitating. Did the entire element, wet pants, came down, celebrating with the group and looked down, had no idea that that person had wet their pants. And the quote from Carl is, this person said, I guess next time I'll need pampers. That's the, that is the true story. That's from Carl. Questions? Yes. The paradox of risk is essentially until I feel safe in the surrounding, I'm not going to take a risk. There are people who don't care that the surrounding is safe. They're just going to take the risk. But those people sometimes are either incredibly, um, I wouldn't say brave or courageous, they're confident, or they're really uh, kind of dangerous and impulsive. You can see some of those people. I'm sorry? Or non-trusting. Or non-trusting? What is this? I miss it. My yellow pen is in the bag and I'm not going to take the time to go get it. Uh, this is a traffic light. Roundabout, traffic circle, rotary, all kinds of things. Statistically, once you've experienced drive, you've experienced both, and you're not texting, which one of these is statistically much, much, much safer? roundabout why one they're going in direction the same direction as opposed to crossing over each other i think there's a metaphor for challenge course too what's what's another reason what's that um uh, not necessarily have you ever at a roundabout going into it you stop and you have to wait yeah what about roundabout Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Because mm -hmm. they're late, and they have to get there. Mm -hmm. 
decides for you. One more. With the traffic light, basically there's this controlling factor that everybody's saying, we give our power to the traffic light. We trust that that's gonna keep us out of trouble. We wait for it to turn color. And when it does, more likely than not, we just put our foot on the gas and we go out there, right? With the traffic circle, as people enter, they have to slow down. When people enter, they have to look to the left to see who's coming towards them. When they're in there, they have to gauge their time and speed. They have to use judgment to when to enter the flow. Have you ever gone around a second time before you got to your exit? That was good judgment. The traffic circle engages the executive function skills. You have to plan, you have to negotiate, you have to communicate. You have to anticipate. You have to be flexible. You have to change your plan. It's external to us. It is an external locus of control. Responsibility to the traffic light. We give authority to the traffic light. And if something goes wrong, we blame the traffic light for the problem. With the traffic circle is based on a concept called the internal locus of control. With the traffic circle, I am in charge and my safety and success relies 100% on my actions and my judgment and my willingness to collaborate with others. It's a completely different game. It comes from a completely different place. The reason, therefore, the reason that these are more safe than these is because human beings are back in control again and they know it. This is about responsibility. This is about blame. The external locus control. On a challenge course, when I decide how you feel, what you need and what you need to do, and I lay that on you and I don't let any other information in, I have become an external locus of control. And if I talk you into doing an element that you're not sure you want to or you don't want to, you said you don't want to, or if I'm not paying attention to the structures that I create that impel people, I am, the program is, an external locus of control. I do not believe that any meaningful growth happens when I talk you into doing things. So we'll get back to the definitions of We'll come back to that. So the internal locus control is really a lot to do with this whole thing. So what I'm gonna do, I'll start handing these to you guys. And if you could put them up there for me, we'll just go right down the wall here. All right. Everybody with me? Okay, now. As we... Experience. Work that I do with groups of provision, education. and choice. Those are the content is that, that, that my work is. How I decide that I work with groups, including this class, one outcome is some content and content the ability on success. This area of 
Anybody cannot? Anybody not? Oh, you have is a that present in taking a lot of taking a lot of energy and do ability to say something your yet we we take the adventure of on a program is everything that I did modality that I believe will create I believe in the least if you could catch the track. I love it. Four people mind. Do you know why? Real one. I go bit through. Anytime you give somebody a second, wow. Three. And I would say three. So adventure in secret. You without you, they were a kind of please achieve the goal that. Said important thing that to have one's self is better about we all are confident in this and more it's all our. It's, we tried. I can plan the process. My consciously my skills and 
and it's me. It was their actions that difference. The equation, they are not about, yes. Others. Last. To me now, I make sure any other way. Background with learning disabilities. Their story is humiliating. But they know they come first because they don't want to look and when they fail at want to try it again. Teams and uh, in some industries, tell you big time. So we'll try to plan, 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 and then when they they fail, they good at the end. The challenge. This is a place where failure is actually one of our best. Voices. We got really in through all this. The agreement. Mistake. A failure will actually.
come from a deep focus control is about responding to locus control. Up, when you 